In today's video, we're going to relook at this, the process of hearing. So to remind you, when we're looking at the structure of the ear, this is the tympanic membrane. Outside uh, will be the auditory canal, which is here. So there's the tympanic membrane, which is shown there in my diagram. Here are the three ossicles, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, or hammer, anvil, and stirrup. And then this pink area is showing you the inner ear. So hearing only takes place in the cochlea, which is this snail shell-like structure. And what I've done for the purpose of the video is I have unraveled the spiral. So there's the tip of the spiral, which I'm showing is there. So if I rolled this up into a circle, it would look like a spiral shape, which is the cochlea. I have also removed from up here, as you can see, the vestibule with the three semicircular canals, which is not visible over here because it is not relevant for the process of hearing. So let's look at how hearing takes place. So when you hear a sound, the sound comes out of someone's vocal cords and it produces sound waves that travel through the air. The pinna or your cartilaginous structure on the outside of your ear traps the sound waves and directs them into the auditory canal. So remember, this is the auditory canal. So the auditory canal directs the sound waves down towards the tympanic membrane and causes the tympanic membrane to vibrate. So that's the second step, that you end up here with sound waves traveling down your into your pinna, which they get directed down the auditory canal in towards your tympanic membrane. Now, these sound waves would be like you hitting the surface of a drum, the skin of a drum. And then that surface of the drum or the skin, like your tympanic membrane, your eardrum, will start to vibrate. Now, because your eardrum or your tympanic membrane is in direct contact with the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, they all are connected to each other. If the tympanic membrane vibrates, so will the hammer. If the hammer vibrates, so will the anvil. If the anvil vibrates, so will the stirrup. It would be like you pushing on a desk or something and causing the other things on the desk to vibrate because they are all in direct contact with each other. So the vibrating tympanic membrane causes the ossicles to vibrate. Now, the stirrup, the last ossicle over here, is in direct contact with the oval window. Remember, O comes before R. The oval window is above the round window. Even though this picture, drawn by hand, doesn't really show that that's more oval than that one. But that is the oval window, that is the round window. So when the stirrup is hitting on this membrane on the oval window, just on the other side of the oval window is a fluid in the cochlea. Remember, your inner ear is fluid-filled. So this fluid here is called perilymph. So that fluid will start to have waves traveling through it. So as a result of the vibrations of the oval window, the vibrations set up what we call pressure waves in the perilymph and the endolymph. So the perilymph is the pink fluid here that I've highlighted, which is um, inside the cochlea. But there's an inner tube of fluid which is surrounded by a soft membrane, which is, and this membrane is filled with the blue fluid called endolymph. Think peri as in upon um, or on top, endo meaning inside. So this is in the inner channel of your cochlea. So it's an exact replica in terms of the shape, but it's just a different fluid. So these waves, they're physically like waves in the ocean, just like if you take a water balloon, you fill it with water, and you tap on the outside of that water balloon. This is the membrane of the balloon. If you're tapping on the outside, so you've got waves that are traveling inside the perilymph. You've got waves here, not sound waves, pressure waves. And every single time those waves touch the membrane of the water balloon or um, here in the ear, more waves start to form inside the endolymph. So the endolymph will start to move as a result of this fluid inside the perilymph moving. Now, situated inside the endolymph, there's this dark blue stripe at the bottom here. This dark blue stripe is the receptor for hearing. So very important, this is the receptor for hearing and it is stimulated by the movement of the endolymph. So the endolymph starts to move and that movement, the waves in the endolymph, 
stimulates the receptor called the organ of corti, uh, which is situated inside the endolymph. And now remember, anything with the nervous system, you take the stimulus and convert it into a nerve impulse. If you've got a reflex arc, the stimulus of heat is converted into a nerve impulse by heat receptors. Here, you've got movement receptors which are stimulated by movement of the fluid depending how fast the fluid is moving or how often it moves will then stimulate different nerve impulses to be produced by the organ of corti so you've always got to identify when we're dealing with the nervous system what converts the stimulus into a nerve impulse in this case the waves are the stimulus and the organ of corti is stimulated by the waves so the organ of corti then will create nerve impulses and those nerve impulses need to travel along the auditory nerve. Auditory means hearing. You have the optic nerve in the eye and the auditory nerve in the ear. So just like in this picture here, you've got this yellow nerve leading away from the cochlea. I've drawn it here as well. This is a branch of the auditory nerve which is taking impulses produced by the organ of corti as a result of hearing to the cerebrum, where the sound will be interpreted. Very important that you name the cerebrum, please, because the cerebrum interprets your senses, and hearing is one of your senses. So, the cerebrum will then interpret the sound as loud or quiet or high-pitched or scary or a nice sound or an unpleasant sound, like scratching on a blackboard, but now we're dealing with these waves that are still traveling through the perilymph. They move until they run out of energy. So these waves are going to travel through and they're going to turn around at the end of the uh, cochlea. And they're going to continue traveling through, coming here, coming here, all the way through. And when they get to the end here, they are going to strike on the round window. Now you don't want these waves hitting a hard surface and bouncing backwards and now coming back because then it's going to confuse the fluid movement inside the endolymph because now the endolymph is going to be doubly stimula stimulated by the sound, same sound. So when those waves hit on the round window, the round window has the very important job of easing out the pressure inside the inner ear. Remember, this is the inner ear. The round window eases out the pressure into this middle ear area. So the pressure will rather be building up in here. This round window is soft, so it absorbs the wave rather than bouncing it backwards. And then the pressure builds up in here. And then the eustachian tube would be involved at some point, which is why your ears pop when you go uphill, up, up a mountain, for example, or an aeroplane. And your eustachian tube keeps the pressure on the out one outside of the eardrum equal to the pressure on the inside of the eardrum. So it maintains equal pressure on either side of the eardrum. But the round window's job is to ease out or release the pressure that builds up in the inner ear. So let's have a question of how this is worded. Essentially, you need to memorize all of these steps here. But let me look at an exam question from an NSC paper where they simply put a question, they describe the process of hearing, and I'll show you the memo. So here they ask, describe the process of hearing. And as you can see, it's very similar to my uh, notes from above. The pinna of the ear traps the sound waves. The auditory canal directs the sound waves to the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane will vibrate, which causes the ossicles to vibrate. The vibrations are passed to the oval window, not the round window. And we deal with this thing called amplifying the vibrations. That is because if you look at the diagram of the tympanic membrane versus the oval window, the tympanic membrane is much, much larger than the oval window. Here's the tympanic membrane surface area. And there's the oval window on the other side of the stirrup. So by having a surface with a large surface area vibrating and those vibrations being concentrated on a smaller spot it's like someone pushing you with a flat hand on your leg and then changing it the same force but pushing you with a finger the finger will hurt a lot more than a flat hand if you use the same force so that's how the tympanic membrane because it's a larger surface area amplifies the vibrations going into the inner ear 
Then the next step is the pressure waves or waves are set up in the inner ear, in the perilymph or endolymph. So you don't have to name the fluid. The organ of corti is stimulated and that's found in the endolymph, which converts the stimulus to an impulse. And please don't say pulse. Not a pulse. It converts it into impulses, which are transmitted along the auditory nerve, not optical nerve, to the cerebrum, where the sound is interpreted. So the last thing I want to draw your attention to is the fact that we start off dealing with the sound waves, sound waves, sound waves. Then the tympanic membrane vibrates, the ossicles vibrate, the oval window will also vibrate. Then we get pressure waves. Then we get the pressure waves stimulating the organ of corti. So be careful. You start off with sound waves, then you get vibrations, then you get pressure waves or just waves, but not sound waves later on. This is one of these questions where you need to practice writing this out, not just simply reading it and saying, oh, I think I understand it. No, 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 no. You have got to read the question, write it out, mark it according to a memo that is always given to you in the past papers. And physically, if you get that question wrong, you rewrite the memo. You've got to practice writing out these longer questions.